doubt it. Uh, this, panel, uh, this panel discussion is entitled Contents and Discontents of Online Participatory Cultures. It is uh, uh, meant to motivate our speakers uh, to basically look at uh, both uh, enabling as well as uh, disabling properties of, of new media in terms of uh, how new media affords or does not afford for relevant participation. Let's uh, start uh, thinking together about uh, the issue that has been uh, tackled a couple of times in the presentations and also in the interventions uh, uh, of uh, the members of the members uh, uh, of the audience. Let's uh, start thinking together uh, about uh, the space for and the place of the political in uh, online uh, participatory activities or in online activities in general. Political communication scholars usually uh, come up with rather depressive figures. Uh, in their research, uh, they come up with the figures that uh, uh, somehow suggest uh, that the hopes of resurrection uh, or revitalization of uh, uh, civic uh, and of, of civic uh, mood uh, and the civic mentality and citizenship is a bit overrated because people usually tend to connect to the entertainment on the internet, not the issues of the public sphere. What they do is that they basically count and measure uh, contacts people do online to the uh, online sites of institutionalized politics. They count uh, the visits, uh, clicks on parliamentary websites, political parties websites, uh, and so on. And uh, these figures uh, are not really very optimistic. But isn't this, as Stefan Coleman put it, isn't this actually desperately narrow definition of the political and the politics? Could we, uh, where, is, where does the political reside? What is political and what is not political in online activities? Can I invite our speakers, starting Professor Jenkins, uh, to reflect uh, on this question? Sure, I, I, I think part of what animates the work that I'm working on with Sangeeta Civic Paths is trying to figure out what connection exists between cu cultural participation, as you were just defining, and political participation. And how can we get a deeper understanding of that? So I would say all of the examples I gave today were both examples of cultural participation in one form or another, people creating media, creating cultural myths, sharing cultural myths, appropriating and remixing the material of the culture industries in ways to serve their own interests, and political in that they're used to advocate for social change. Now, some of that political activity takes place through governmental sectors, and some of it takes place through communal civic sectors. Uh, and I think a lot of things that count for political only in terms of voting behavior don't adequately deal with the rise of boycotts and boycotts, the rise of a variety of other kind of political structures that are changing the nature of the political debate that we're, we're going, we're dealing with. So I, I would say that we are actually a moment, what interests me at the moment is that there may, we may be seeing signs that stuff that people learn how to do in play is emerged as political. Ethan Zuckerman has this, what he calls a cat picture theory of revolution, where he argues any platform sophisticated enough and any set of communities sophisticated enough to trade cheap cat pictures can be used to overturn a government under the right circumstances. And it's about latent capacity, it's about acquired skills, it's about building a community that can pave the way for it. But the key word there is the right circumstances. So I really liked what Nico just had to say, and I think. You know, it'd be very easy to read it as opposite sides of some sort of spectrum, because critical studies and cultural studies are often framed that way. But in fact, I think we're asking the same questions and arriving at the same answers. And I see a focus on the mechanisms of participation, 
the values of participation and the shared topic that critical and cultural studies can talk about together. And it leaves me hopeful that we're at a point where we can refine our vocabulary enough to make some of the distinctions that were just being made. I think if we apply those distinctions to the group I, groups I was talking about, we would see that, in fact, many of them do have a high quality of participation by most of the axes he was describing. And that would then allow us to locate specifically what are the things that block participation and what things impel participation. And can we create a space of greater quality of political participation? Um, uh, to go back to the original question for, for a second, um, in a way, the political is everywhere. Uh, something we tend to forget. Traditional uh, political studies approaches have always uh, explained to us that the political is only in institutionalized politics. And I think that is a power strategy in itself. And we should move beyond that kind of logics. The political is in the family, is in the educational system, it's within the media, it's basically everywhere. Uh, it's not because uh, we have a parliament at home, thank God we don't, but because we have conflicts and power relationships in every of these social settings. So the political is basically everywhere. The question then becomes, what kind of political do we have? And what kind of political do we want to have? And there is indeed a dialogue which is very necessary uh, between critical and cultural studies and looking at where we can go. It is also being fed by more newer approaches in, in political studies uh, where people are looking at, well, what way should we actually go? There is the crisis of representative democracy. There is the crisis of institutionalized politics. The system isn't actually working that well. At the same time, and this is actually what your work shows wonderfully, people are horribly engaged. They're very active, but in a very different way. And there is a disconnect between these two systems, institutionalized politics that is saying we are representing the people and the people themselves that are actually dealing with other topics in other ways than institutionalized politics is doing. So we have what is called the crisis of representative democracy. And at the same time, we have nothing but political activity. We have, well, not just kids, not just youngsters. We have many, many different cases. I mean, your 42-year-old school teacher is a wonderful example of somebody who is actually being political, is trying to change the power balance between a major broadcaster and a, um, a fan group or a group of fans. And these kinds of changes are absolutely crucial. And they, for me, are all political, and they do matter in trying to reconfigure uh, the social, I would say. So a quick example of how institutionalized politics breaks down around these questions. The Obama administration came in and said, we're going to create a place where we hear from the public what issues concern them the most. And what rose to the top of the public concerns was legalization of marijuana, which nods unexpectedly, but the Obama administration dismissed both it and the mechanism saying this is an example of the trivialization of politics by participatory practices. Rather than admitting that it's a political landfill that they as an administration weren't ready or prepared to act on, but it's a legitimate set of concerns for a variety of different constituencies. The war on drugs has done damage to many different groups in the society. And to define that as not an appropriate political topic, because it doesn't meet the existing agendas of an elite representative system, sort of shows the breakdown, how unwilling they really are often to embrace a fully participatory system of power and culture. I think it relates to um, how we define legitimate issues. It's like, I think people are very um, good at organizing themselves, for example, to get a certain feature in a video game included. And they're very good at that. And, uh, and you can see all sorts of political activities going on. You know, they're campaigning for it. They're trying to, um, you know, get coverage and so on, but um, would we consider this like a playground on which you can sort of like learn how these things work? Is it translatable? Is it, uh, or, or, or would we just call this, you know, um, political activity for, uh, with, a, with, a apolitical, with an apolitical goal? India context that I 
was speaking about is that in that context specifically, Henry and I were talking about in the break, no one had any trouble seeing that as a political act uh, that was really by the newspapers, by the press, by the media. In fact, the struggle was for the participants because they wanted, for, what, for many reasons, they wanted that to be seen as a cultural act and as an artistic act. So there's actually the border uh, or the definitions of where the cultural becomes the political or where the political is cultural lie in a very different place there. And actually, one of our colleagues and a former classmate of mine, Aswin Kunatan Becker, wrote a really interesting contribution to the special issue that just came out where he actually talked about the struggle to not have all participation be political or seen as political in India, where the actual struggle is to have, have the possibility for cultural The thing is that these probably these two are not mm, binary opposite uh, categories. There is more like a continuum, uh, not a two opposite categories. And uh, Jakub? Um, I just at first I wanted to say uh, thank you, Nico, because when you said that politics is everything and everywhere, you blew it. Because you're right, definitely. But then all the other answers will be just uh, illustrative. So thank you. Um, but I will give some illustration. I'll give you some illustration from another point of view. Uh, when uh, doing research within families, uh, when looking for the way how they use media in everyday context, in everyday life, we have found some some one interesting thing. Uh, the, the micro-politics of power relations within the family are really important for how people do interact with media, what they do with media. Uh, two examples of two different families with the same social and biographical, almost, almost the same social and biographical uh, background. In one family they do not use Facebook and Twitter because they neg negotiated that this is not a proper way how to spend leisure time. This is a form of escapism from the family and we will not, I like the word we, we will not do that. This is inappropriate for a 32 years old couple with two kids. She said, in fact. <laughs> used the word we. He accepted. Uh, in the other couple, they thought that this is the best way how to show the world that the family is fully functioning, to share with the world just some sometimes some pictures of them and children and doing uh, Boy Scouts clubs and that stuff and that they're good Christian or whatever. And uh, these two different answers come from a battlefield. We, all of us, we know these battlefields. We are fighting in IKEA every second weekend for this furniture and this forks and this meal bowl, whatever. And this is the way how we, in this battlefield, in these battlefields, we construct our relationship to what we can call participation as well. And this is about power. It is about micropolitics. And there are, there are gender issues, and there, uh, is, there are biopolitics. When I see Johanna here, and she's interested in it, and everything, those small things are constructed the background, the wider context. Maybe to correct something I, I said before when I was uh, bitching about Giddens, there is actually one other thing <laughs> he also did, which, which was really good, and that's a book on the, um, the democracy of intimacy on the families and how actually it was applying David Held, the guy I was referring to earlier on, he was applying that to the family and what he was analyzing is how the family actually works like a political entity. Of course obviously there are much more but it is very much about how these families function in a democratic or, or undemocratic way and in, in some earlier work we've been talking about democratic family ship. Uh, you all know citizenship, but we should also look at families as, as sites of democracy and democratic familyship has been an, an attempt to translate that idea. And you can look at all these social spheres and what you basically see 
uh, struggles and conflicts. And they're not necessarily problematic. It's actually a matter of how we deal with them. And in some cases, we see them being dealt with in very, very problematic ways, where there's a very authoritarian decision being made and others actually have no say whatsoever. And that very, very same model can be applied to all our social realities. And it is a choice between elitist, authoritarian models and very democratic participatory models. And we see that choice being made. There are many cases where governments who have a tendency of leaning towards these more representative, non-participatory models, they are still very much struggling with the participatory realities. There are many cases where we actually see e-government, e-democracy being used for the political agenda of these governments themselves. And these are, of course, non-participatory processes, utterly problematic, that are using the label of participation to set the political agenda of that specific party or government. And these are things that we should try to get rid of, but they are incredibly difficult to get rid of. Uh, we will always be looking for some kind of balance, but we just need to push the balance a bit more away from these elitist models, more into the direction of the participatory, because I simply think that we will end up in a better and a more pleasant, sometimes more difficult, but still a pleasant and more better way, a world, a way of living. Uh, I just wanted to say that when listening to words about authorita authoritarian power relations, uh, I found this quite ironic that uh, a democracy, the wider democratic system, is uh, very often based on very authoritarian uh, relationships, family relationships that uh, lie behind it. I want to respond to this discussion on two levels. The first is to note that we're certainly not the first to imagine the family as a hotbed of democracy. I mean, I say I wrote on post-war American children's literature that sort of suggests that there was a lot of writing, uh, progressive writing, in the end, after the end of World War II, both in America and I gather from conversations I've had here in Czechoslovakia that sought to use childhood and the family to reinvent society in a more democratic direction. And I think we learn a lot by going back and looking at that material. The second is, I was really intrigued, Jakob, by your pathology of motives. Um, but I, I was troubled by the, the, ten, the, the ways in which you were talking about uh, performing the self, which, see, if I understood you correctly, was it strived either in terms of with society of the spectacle or in terms of narcissism. But I think what that erases is, is the whole notion of the personal as political that comes out of feminism and queer politics and identity politics of all kinds, where in fact asserting the personal narrative is the step toward the political. So if we look at the dream activists that I work at, and pointing the video at yourself and saying, my name is Aham Mohammed and I'm undocumented and I'm going to tell you my story, is in one sense performing the self. Mohammed's telling his own story, but he's trying to change power relations at a very personal level, to put a face to a set of power relations that are otherwise invisible. It's very easy to dismiss the immigrant if you don't see immigrants, if you don't talk to immigrants, if you don't hear their stories, if you don't understand the personal effects of it. So I would argue that if we're going to have a robust theory of participatory politics in the digital era, we have to start by claiming the ability to tell our own stories is a deeply political act and not simply narcissistic or not simply abstraction or spectacle that, that disallow, disenables the political. I don't have any thoughts. Yes, I just do, I didn't want to, didn't want to say that it's just about narcissism. This was just something that was here emerging in the data. Uh, when you're talking about uh, the self-exposure from the other point of view, uh, it rather looks like Richard Sennett was luckily wrong in the late 70s when he said, uh, when he said uh, that the public man has fallen and is not there anymore. And I think this is a good news. Because I like Richard Sennett, but uh, even more I like his being wrong. <laughs> 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 Well, uh, 
Let's uh, now turn our attention to the issue that is different but still belongs to the same, I would say, paradigm uh, because it attracts a lot of attention uh, also on the level of policy making and it's media literacy, digital, uh, digital literacy. This is something that Henry wrote uh, on and was, uh, uh, was interested in. Uh, not uh, rather recently uh, is digital literacy well Nico actually mentioned that uh, there are various uh, modes of uh, being political uh, online uh, should there be a program uh, of uh, enhancing digital literacy uh, that would uh, uh, you know, maximize the chance uh, of uh, selecting the proper votes. There is the concept of quality television in television studies. Should there be something like quality internet? Should there be a part of uh, um, education curricula, for example? What, what do you think about uh, Yarda? Uh, you are very much uh, involved uh, in the study of digital natives, also I'm not the fan of the concept either. Do they, do these people who've been, you know, uh, playing these games whose names I will never remember, do they need digital literacy or the, are they just completely literate already? Okay. Um, well, I think there's a lot of literacy, but again, the thing is, what, how do you define what's good. Uh, you know, people tend to discuss games a lot and there are fierce discussions about which game is better than the other one. And uh, people um, define themselves by liking a particular game and disliking uh, another game. And uh, the, the thing is that the, the, the level of discussion tends to, I mean, it's, um, it, it's, it's different in, in, different, in different places. And uh, the thing is, how do we facilitate the discussion so that it's so that people learn how to discuss so that uh, you know they learn something more than just trolling and um, also what I wanted to say uh, was that um, they tend to know a lot about specific stuff it's very database like knowledge uh, they know a lot of they know a lot of things about the history of video games they know the titles they know the uh, years of release but they don't, they struggle when they are supposed to uh, write about experiences of playing games, they struggle when they're um, supposed to write about what, what's in unique to the medium and like trying to find some other ways this, this medium could work. So I, I think that there is just knowledge and just a space to discuss things is, is probably not enough and I just wonder where these other sort of motives or skills or tendencies come from, like when you actually start to be critical and saying, so this is not what I want my games to be. I, I want to do something else. I want to play something else. See, I, I don't approach me new media literacies in terms of quality control. I think there are certain things we want to do, the ability to assess the quality of information. But to me, it's part of this larger struggle over participation and ensuring that, in fact, the broadest range of people have control over the means of cultural production, circulation, and deliberation, that those basic skills ought to govern media literacy. And in some ways, my model looks very much like Nico's breakdown between access, uh, interaction, and participation. That what we discover in the Ameri that the, 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 for the first 10 years of the digital era, we fought over digital access. The American context, it's now to the point that 95% of American youth have some form of access to network computing. The 5% that are left tend to be, among others, Native Americans on reservations who have historically been denied a lot of other technical accesses and are definitely one of the most disempowered segments of American society. There's an uneven level of access in the people who have access at home and unlimited access, and others have access through schools and libraries that have mandatory filters that block certain key sites of participation and discussion from being used and so forth. So there's still a struggle over access. As we go to what you're calling interaction, uh, what we see is that many kids who have access to the technology don't have mentorship, don't have ways of connecting to meaningful 
forms of participation. And so there's a different kind of participation, what I call the participation gap in my language, is unequal access to opportunities to participate in meaningful ways through the internet. And beyond that, beyond participation in my vocabulary, there's what we call the empowerment gap. And that is you have access to cultural participation forums, but you're not yet empowered or don't feel confident enough to be able to assert that voice in a public sphere debate, that you, the moving from the cultural to the political is still a challenge for you. So the job of media literacy education is in part to ensure young people have access to the skills and resources they need to move each step down that continuum until they become critical participants in the core conversations of the society. And that's something that needs to be owned by schools, yes, because they may be the only place that everyone has access to, but also by all kinds of institutions that affect kids and by families and by communities. This is something we all should be invested in if we're going to bring about the political change that I think many of us are talking about here. I wouldn't say it better. Uh, Nico, you wanted to add something, didn't you? Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the literacy debate is a tricky one because the concept of literacy is also a bit problematic. It, it tends to individualize things a lot. Uh, you as an individual, you have to be made literate. Uh, and, and that makes me always a bit awkward. Uh, at the same time, this is about learning and how learning goes and digital learning. The second point that I think matters here to me um, is this rather troubling issue of, well, what's the power dynamics within this process of learning? And this is the old Paolo Freire debate from, from the 1970s and before. Uh, who's the teacher? And who's the pupil? And what rights does the pupil have to speak against the teacher? Uh, and I think what a, uh, a more democratic form of, of education and learning is, is, is based on providing context, providing frameworks. And it's not about the best framework, uh, quality television or whatever it's called, obviously. Uh, it's providing a set of frameworks that allow people, young people in many cases, to come to a better understanding of the world. It's also about have, giving them access to skills so that they themselves then can apply them in ways that they want to apply them without teachers like us, because in a way we're all teachers, uh, tell them to do. And the, the, the one concept that groups all that for me together is the notion of democratic quality. And that is something which is very dear to me. And in that sense, I'm very much in favor of the quality concept not as in, in professional quality or in cultural quality or aesthetic quality. I'm interested in democratic quality. And for me, that is obviously a participatory process. And for that reason, I, I think we should start using this concept of democratic quality more because it captures a lot of the things that we want to achieve with education and learning. So I, I couldn't, I agree totally, and Ferrari has been a very important influence on the work we're doing. We're, we're doing some teacher training, professional development workshops of teachers to get them to think about creating a more democratic structure in the classroom, and it very much animates the work, the work that we're, that we're involved with. I think that's, that's key, and it can't be about top-down mandating of control. To some degree, this is what I meant when I was critiquing the digital native and the digital immigrant language, is that the two variants of the digital immigrant, one is the one who's still in control and driving things, and the other is the one who's passive and refuses to participate. And neither of those is an ideal form of democratic leadership to go back to the language you were, you were using before. That in fact what we want are teachers who understand, who have some expert knowledge, who can understand the infrastructures and the risk and benefits, but are also willing to give up control and create a space where there's more participation. And that's what we see a bit more of in the fan communities, for example, where adults and youth who share common interests and are committed to building a more participatory culture are able to share, not, share experiences with each other without necessarily imposing an adult-child hierarchy, that there are other structures at play. Um, and that has consequences, I think, in terms of how political socialization takes place for young people coming up in that. So in convergence culture, I talked about um, Flourish, who at the time was 
I think I interviewed her at 17. She had started writing fan novels online at 13. By 14, she was beta reading and giving feedback to adult writers. By 15, she was instrumental in helping to create one of the first fa big fa Harry Potter fan fiction communities online. And she's now, she became my graduate student at MIT. She's now become a fan relations person in the industry and an in internal critic in the media industry challenging the ways they treat their fan communities. But her ability to be socialized starting at 13 and 14 as an equal participant in building this community I think made a huge difference in terms of how she saw herself and how she, how she saw the world. And she was deeply empowered, highly articulate at 17 when I interviewed her for the book. To, uh, we work closely with Mimi Ito and the uh, digital DMO, the digital, what is it? Digital Media Board. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm having my jet lag moment. <laughs> but what Mimi Ito keeps bringing up and what her Connected Learning Network is working on right now is the question of transfer. So in, you know, in Flourish's example, she was able to transfer the, the skills and the learning that she had um, to, different, to different spheres as she moved along in her own trajectory. Um, what we see in some of our different cases is, is different places where that transfer sometimes happens and sometimes it doesn't happen as in the ways that, you know, if you were in, in sort of thinking about a learning curve, we sometimes see it actually not transfer and sometimes we do. And we actually see that the, the community, um, we stress, we, have, we really stress the community in the work that we do, that the community is actually crucial. So it's a very, in helping that transfer happen. And um, so it's not necessarily happening in the groups, communities we study, it doesn't necessarily happen in the classroom anyway. So it's just something from our own. Yeah, I remember one thing. Um, I know that, as uh, Henry said, the metaphor is not ideal, and it really is not. But uh, the get generation gap between uh, those non native and native, whatever. Uh, we are witnessing now in teacher people, I think, a very interesting thing uh, because. New way for a generation, or difficult to say because it's not a generational question, but new wave of social activists and political activists is rising. And uh, I think all the Czech uh, kids here in the room, they know what I'm talking about when I say uh, Jim Brno and uh, other examples. Young people using new media social networking sites, uh, conventional websites, uh, are influencing the political process, uh, democratic procedures, because they feel deficit of democracy. And they are challenging it, they are making fun of it, and they are uh, finally uh, going into legislative process. The fact is that they are that there's a huge gap between those people who represent democracy and these activists. They don't understand, well, the activists understand completely those guys up there. Those guys up there, they don't understand anything. They're confused, they're lost, they don't know what's joke, what's relevant. And I think it shows that there is something uh, like a gap in participation, in ways how to participate, in ways how to understand what does it mean to participate for democracy, for doing it better. And I think this is really interesting because uh, Petra Ilačeva, she's not here, one of our students, MA students now graduating, she made a really good study on these activists and she shows uh, how they work, how they manage the social capital, the political capital, everything. And it's really interesting. Uh, because I believe when uh, those guys out there will read it, they will not understand it, so they will not understand those activists uh, also. But for the others, it would be like more clear. It uh, really seems that, well, uh, the thing that, that is a good thing, good news for democracy and bad news for the power holders is that. It actually follows that the really important anti-hegemonic 
movement, or if not exactly movement, that at least the kind of energy uh, is getting accumulated on the unexpected sides where uh, it uh, cannot be controlled or extincted, extinguished sorry, uh, that easily. So the, the, the thing that people do not uh, get in touch with the political via uh, contacts with the institutionalized politics can actually be rephrased not as a negative thing, uh, but uh, as a uh, positive uh, development and positive di dynamics. Just one illustration to, to, to what I said and to what you said. Uh, funny thing is, an important thing I believe is that uh, one third of these activists has active experience with being part of the They've tried to participate in institutionalized politics, but they realized for them it is impossible. And then they choose. The, 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 the way, the, the, the reason why they choose a uh, different way, a different path. Well, we carry on a path, but it, it's fun for all of us, and I have to read and so on every morning, so I'm glad they do that. Another nice thing I have just realized is that this debate is actually taking place on the auspices of Institute of Economy, <clears throat> one of the bastions of neoliberal thinking and uh, status quo. Uh, legitimation in the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, so I hope they don't want to just refurbish and repaint and uh, somehow uh, clean the room uh, after we leave. Uh, our time is uh, slowly, we are sl slowly running out of time. So let me ask the last uh, more or less ritual question. What is your opinion about the uh, future of participatory cultures online? Can it be still radicalized? Are we, should we expect some, mm, you know, something surprising, some, some other developments, or will it, you know, uh, on the other hand, uh, will it get reduced? Should, we, should there be something like a general, should there be an authoritative regime on the internet? Should there be a general secretary <coughs> of the internet or something like that soon? Oh no, but the, seriously, the, the question is about the future of uh, online participation. What can it bring? So, just because I'm the former MIT guy, I get the future question first. <laughs> uh, you know, I can, I, first of all, I think none of, there's nothing inevitable about the outcomes in any way, shape, or form. No, not, nothing technologically inevitable. This is a debate I had at MIT that all of my designer friends thought we just build the right tools and it inevitably lead to a democratization of society. And that's a particular technological utopian notion of inevitability. Uh, I don't think, while I believe in empowered consumers and I believe in the agency of audiences, I don't necessarily believe there's a guaranteed outcome that leads in greater participation and greater democracy. It's a struggle, uh, and I think that's a struggle. I think on the other end, you know, critical studies is healthily skeptical until it becomes cynical, right? And a kind of cynicism that says inevitably everything that's offered to us is corrupt and corrupting and we're going to be disempowered. We, we give away any opportunities for power if we embrace that as our basic philosophy. So what I liked about Nico's talk was it held open space for meaningful participation that we can fight to achieve. And I think I share the sense that this is a struggle we have to participate in. My mentor in grad school, John Fisk, wrote a book, Media, pa Media Matters, at the end of his career, in which he has a passage that has become more and more meaningful to me over time, in which he says new media represent new opportunities to struggle, new terrains that struggle can take place in new resources we can mobilize and struggle. But what he doesn't say in that book is that it results in a particular outcome. So I'm optimistic. I see signs that people are acquiring skills over time and mobilizing and making meaningful use of these technologies. I'm always a glass half full guy, and that's probably why I'm cultural studies and not critical studies. But I also am skeptical that every pathway leads to the right results. 
I'm increasingly critical of Web 2.0 as I was here because I think it gives the guise of participation without ensuring meaningful participation. I'm skeptical of the government programs like what happened as a story I told about Obama's administration where they started with a rhetoric of participation but were reluctant to respond to the results they got when they actually tried to listen to the community. So there's really lots of dead ends here. Lots of things that can block us from moving toward a more participatory culture. Yet nevertheless, the optimist in me believes that over the last 20 years, we have moved decisively in a direction toward greater and greater control on the grassroots level over the means of cultural production, circulation, and deliberation, and that that's a sign that we're moving toward a more participatory culture. Still thinking, yeah, but that's a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> Jakub, uh, have you stopped thinking some time ago already, or can you still? You don't think much in China, he doesn't think much. It's complex, and any time we try to say what will happen next year, we fail, we will be able. We sit here, ask the economists about uh, taxes and uh, GDP for the next year, and I don't know what these guesstimates are. Depends on. Well, some people don't want to have these participative platforms here because they got the power, they got their posi positions, they got everything. The other are getting stronger and stronger at the moment and need and want to participate and have it. I don't know. Yeah, well, well, let's maybe make it a little bit more precise. Where is the site of, where is this get, where does this, where is this getting decided? Is it Microsoft engineers? Is it Apple engineers? Is well, it I, I, I out of the corporate really terrain that, at all? None of them. I hope really not none of them. <laughs> because both of them are you know, commercial corporations and let them do anything. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. You'll plan it out afterwards. No, Sangeeta. <laughs> <laughs> but just going back to what Henry, we know Henry talking about Malcolm Gladwell and the Twitter revolution and how clearly what is now popularly called the era of spring, because that term is very contested uh, on many levels, um, clearly didn't happen over Twitter, right? Uh, and so just the same way, but we, in the groups that we study, like the dream activists, we see a very smart, intelligent, and um, innovative and timely use of new media, but at the same time we see it combined with more traditional modes of organizing which are shifting uh, to accommodate and to make space for new media and they're, they're shifting. So we actually see an interesting interplay between traditional on the ground mobilizing and new media. And not, we don't actually see those as separate and they're playing, but, they're, but the interesting thing is that we actually see them really negotiated. But in each one of the cases that we look at, that relationship is negotiated differently. And so I really see a lot of hope uh, for, that, for that negotiation to really Bring really innovative change. Where in the case of the Dreamers, um, it's my belief that, that actually the traditional organizations couldn't have done it alone, doing the great rights of organizations, but just in the same way, the Dreamers with their new media uh, organizing couldn't have done it alone either. So it was actually a, a coming together uh, that happened in the last few months that I believe really helped that. Yeah. There's, there's no way, of course, of uh, predicting the future. Uh, there are only indications uh, which allow us to say something. Uh, we should be very careful, though. There was in the, uh, the Documenta, which is Castle Arts Exhibition, Documenta number 10, the title was Democracy Unrealized. Uh, democracy and participatory culture will always be unrealized. There's no end point. It will never be achieved. We can come closer but we can never reach this end point. That is an, an impossibility. Uh, there will always be struggle, there will always be contestation, there will always be elitist forces trying to sort of make things go back to the old ways. Secondly, there's no history which is a continuous process. There's not a linear history to be written about participation. There's not one way we will go. Uh, any kind of prediction that doesn't take that into account is going to uh, end up in, into trouble. Uh, Henry talked about 20 years ago. Uh, let me go back 200 years ago. 
let's go to the French Revolution and let's compare. Let's see all the steps we have taken so far. And for me, that is the major indication that our democracy is becoming deepened, that the levels of participation have increased. I showed you a picture of the Leviathan. This was the time of, of the civil war in, in England when, according to Hobbes, life was short, brutish, and nasty. That was the image of life in these days. We had the French Revolution, there was an American Revolution, there were all these processes of democratization, and we've had different waves. And I think we've entered a new wave of democratization driven by, not necessarily by technology, but by the ways we've started to use it. And that is, I think, a very hopeful process. It will not be the last wave. There will be others after this, if we're lucky. Uh, there are indications that we are moving towards these new waves. But if we're not lucky, then we'll then end up with the exact opposite, the nightmare scenario, the total uh, redrawal into authoritarian nationalist uh, discourses, which can be utterly dis destructive, as we've seen before. Okay, um, yeah, I got my microphone. Uh, so, I, I think that talking about the future should be left to science fiction writers. <laughs> and um, and the current actor, who, who Henry mentioned, is one of them. And, um, and although we try to be not at all technologically deterministic here, I think that what he's saying about the power of um, the digital technology and computer is to some extent right, that the engineers from Microsoft and from Apple gave us this powerful tool, as, as was the printing press before, the, this powerful tool and now there are all these attempts at, at taking, it, taking it back, you know, just like closing technology and so on. So I think this will be one of the sites where this, you know, decision, where decisions will be made about, about like the future, as we call it. This is one of, one of the sites. Thank you very much. I especially liked the future as we call it. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's just one of the labels that can be given. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our presenters and uh, members of the panel uh, to invest their time and their uh, mental energy, uh, their intelligence, into uh, this symposium and I would also like to of course thank you the participants uh, for being patient and the wonderful audience and I patient yeah yeah but yeah there is the, as far as participatory logics are really penetrating all spheres of life there is now also the theory of uh, active patienthood, right, in, 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 the, in terms, in the sphere of uh, health communication. So you can be actively patient, basically. Uh, and thank you for being actively patient. And um, uh, this is uh, somehow the closing uh, sentence of the symposium. Thank you <laughs> once again for coming.